the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from pastors here at the Rock. And Jesus, we acknowledge your presence. We acknowledge you in every way. You said in your word that if you be lifted up, you will draw all men unto you. And Father, it's because we've lifted you up in this place that you've drawn people here. And we're so thankful. We're so thankful. Father, for the word tonight, we thank you. We thank you that you sent your word. You healed us. You've given us the word to, to know what we should do with every area of our life. And so, Father, tonight we look to your word and we thank you for the teacher, the great teacher, the Holy Spirit, who will teach us and reveal to us all things. So, Father, I acknowledge that I don't know as I ought to know, but you know all things. So, Father, we don't get our eyes on a person tonight, but we look to you and we allow you to teach us. So whatever goes forth, Father, you let there be a lesson on the inside of each person. Let them make the application to their lives. Let them hear it as you desire them to hear it and apply it to their lives in the areas that they need. And Father, we thank you. We give you honor. We give you glory. We give you praise. And everybody said, amen. Amen, amen, amen. 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 Well, you may be seated. You may be seated. As Pastor Dan said, my name is Sue Bryan. My husband, Mike, is right there on the front row. And and, um, actually, uh, this last spring, we we celebrated 18 years here at The Rock. And and we're so honored. This is such a privilege to be in this great house. Do you realize this is a great house? It's a great house. And I've been around a lot of churches, and I can tell you that this church is the real deal. So if you're new, I want to welcome you and and invite you to come back and and you'll get a chance to hear our our senior pastor, Pastor Jim, our executive pastor, Dan, and some of the other pastors on staff. And it's not, it's not usually me. So anyway, but I'm privileged and I'm blessed to be here tonight and get to minister to you. Um, I'm just curious, how many of you were here Wednesday night when Reverend Al Fury ministered? Oh, a lot of you already, and you just came back for more, huh? Well, good job. Well, yeah, um, we were on vacation, and so I listened to his message, and I went, oh, (laughs) call Pastor Dan, and I just don't want to minister on the Holy Spirit. But so we're going to actually kind of call this a part two tonight, if that's okay, and because our our Sunday night people tend to be our diehards. You guys are the diehards. I mean, Sunday morning wasn't enough. You're back, right? And so, um, so we're going to look at the Word of God and get into the Word of God a little bit, especially concerning the gifts of the Spirit, and so that you have some understanding. I've found that the enemy runs havoc with your brain with fear when you're not taught. And so I'm a stickler for the Word of God, and I like to clearly teach in some of these areas because I know the things that I went through in my life when the Word of God came in and I saw that what the Word of God actually said and not what this elder taught me and not what that person said and not what Aunt Lucy said, but what the Word of God actually taught, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, faith rose in my heart and I received. And so this is one of those areas that I like to just, you know, just knock out the devil with the Word of God. And dispel any fear that they're not, it's not weird, it's not woo-woo, it's Bible. And if it was good enough for the early church, it's good enough for us. Amen? Amen, amen, amen. How many of you know there, there's not two churches? There is the church of the living God. And so we're just writing that last chapter. And so what he began with the early church never should have subsided in any way. And, we're, and I believe he's returning for a victorious church. And I believe that we're going to go out of here in a blaze of glory. So we've got some cranking up to do. Would you agree? Yes, yes, yes. Well, anyway, 
Before I get started, I just want to share my uh, personal testimony just a little bit. Uh, this isn't all about me tonight. But a lot of times when you hear um, where someone is coming from and uh, a, an experience that um, you can, you know, it can help you um, enlighten the word or see what the word of God is, how it's been applied to someone else's life. And I was uh, raised in church, knew about Jesus as far back as I can remember. And I actually received Jesus as a nine-year-old girl in the midnight hour on my bed, just the Holy Spirit dealing with me. And I told him, yes, I'll go to Africa. It's always Africa, right? I'll go where I I did get to minister in Africa. That was a joy. But, um, but God dealt with my heart, and I love God. I love God my whole life. I went back to school the next day and preached to my little Catholic, Catholic girlfriend and told her she was going to hell because she was Catholic. <laughs> Anyway, that was my version of witnessing. But, um, but anyway, um, love God and, and, and serve God to the best of my ability as a child and growing up. But then when I hit my teenage years and my young adult years, I found myself very, very frustrated to actually live it. I believed it in my head. I believed it in my heart. I would get into the word of God. But it seemed like I did not have the power to really live it. And so it was in my junior year in college that I just cried out to God. I just said, God, you know, if it's a different church, if it's a different, you know, if I'm supposed to be Mormon. No, I, I said, whatever it is, Father. <laughs> Father, I, I, all I knew was that I wanted more of him. And I would read the Bible. It seemed like I would try to get it with my head, but, but I didn't really, it, it didn't help me know him better. And it didn't draw me closer to him. And so I was very frustrated. I don't know if any of you relate to that. But I was very frustrated. And so I just cried out to him, God, I just want more of you. I just want to know you more. Whatever it is, I'm open. You show me. And I think it was because I, I let down some of that, you know, I, I'm right and I've got the right doctrine. I know it all. And just opened my heart to him that he was able to send someone to minister to me. So it was about three days later, I ran into a student on campus. I was attending Pepperdine University. And um, he began to open the word of God to me and showed me some scripture, scriptures that I'd actually seen before. But it was just like the scales fell off my eyes and my heart opened and I knew that the missing link was the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And so I was like, oh, oh, oh how, where, when? And he said, well, you can receive right now. He laid hands on me. I got gloriously filled with the Holy Spirit and immediately began to speak in a heavenly language that I'd never learned before. And it was like the dam of my heart was just broken open. And I mean, I'd been living on the planet. And so I'd been rejected and I'd rejected and, and all of the above. And it was like the dam of my heart was just broken open and I wept and I wept and there was a healing that came in and a strengthening that came in. And the other thing that happened to me is I had been plagued for years with depression and insecurity. Overwhelming depression would come over me like a black cloud and just sort of, sort of hover over me, sometimes for weeks at a time. And it seemed like I was powerless to get out from under that thing. Remember one time just staring in a mirror and going, what do I look like? I don't even know what I look like. There was just, it was just a weird negativity and depression that had, would saturate my soul. And then I'd get up one morning and it'd be gone. It was like, oh good, we'll have a good few days. But if it rolled in, I was, I was just, you know, I would be of no use to anybody. And I had girlfriends that would say, you know, sometimes you can be the life of the party, but sometimes... You know, we got to just take you home. Because I didn't know how to get out of that funk when I was in it. I don't know if you relate to that. But when I got filled with the Holy Spirit, that spirit of depression was broken in a nanosecond. And I just turned 60 and I haven't had a depressed day since. Now that's the power of the Holy Spirit. Now Al Fury gave us a lot of definitions of the power talked about in, first, in Acts 1.8. That that power, that word power, 
The Greek word is dunamis. It's where we would get our word dynamite. And I like to tell the kids in children's church that you can receive dynamite power and blow up the works of the devil. And that's exactly what happens. When you get filled with the Holy Spirit, dunamis power comes in. The Greek rendering actually connotates a, 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 an expression called explosions of almightiness. Explosions of almightiness. God in his power comes on the scene and blows out whatever's not of him. Now we're going to go to the word of God. And I want to show you that it's one thing to be born of the spirit. But it's yet another thing to be filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? Are you with me? So let's look at the word of God. In Acts 8... Excuse me, Acts 6, 5 through 8. The early church, they had a situation. They had the Grecian widows that weren't really being cared for properly. And they needed um, someone to basically serve them or wait on them. This was their version of ushers, actually. And so they were going to pray and pick people that could help with that. And it says in Acts 6, verse 5, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Then the word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Stephen, who was an usher, was set apart through prayer. He was picked because he was full of faith and the Holy Spirit. How many of you know we can have anointed ushers around here? Yeah, they'll catch you just right when you fall. And they, they've got some discernment too. They know who to talk to sometimes. But Stephen, it says, was full of faith and power. Full of faith and power. And he did great wonders and signs among the people. God wants us to be full of faith and power. Now you stick around here and you get teaching on faith. Amen? And you learn how to believe that you receive your needs met and believe for your healing and believe for your financial needs. And there's a spirit of faith on this church. I love that. I said, God, years ago, I said, God, always have us in a soul winning church. Always have us in a soul winning church. And every church that my husband and I have been privileged to be a part of has been known as a soul winning church. And we have faith to believe for souls. Amen? So I would say we've, we're full of faith around here. But he also wants us full of power. Amen? Amen. Well, in Mark 16, 17, and 18, it says that these signs will follow those who believe. It says that signs followed Stephen. Great wonders. We're not going to talk about that. Great wonders. Perhaps he walked on water like Jesus did. Perhaps he multiplied uh, loaves and fishes and fed five or seven thousand. Perhaps he raised people from the dead. That would be great wonders. But he said, great wonders and signs followed Stephen. And in Mark 16, 17, and 18, it says, and these signs will follow those who believe. Now, how many believers do we have in here? I like to say it like this. Will the believers please believe? He says, and these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. Yeah, that would be good in the office, right? They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. These were the signs that were following Stephen. These are the signs that should be following us as believers. You and me, Joe Schmo believers, turn to your neighbor and say, you're a believer. You're a believer. Stephen was an usher. He was waiting on tables. 
He was tending to very practical things. At this point, we don't see that he was even called to a, a ministry office per se. He was being faithful in the house of God. But he did it with faith, and he did it with power. And it says, signs followed him because he believed. He was a believer. And the Bible says that these signs will follow us if we'll believe. Jesus said in John 14, 12, Most assuredly I say to you, He who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he'll do, because I go to be my, with my Father. In another place he said, it, you know, it's necessary. It's expedient that I go away, because if I don't go, the Comforter won't come. He says, I've been with you, and all your needs have been met, but he's going to be in you. And he's going to, you're going to do the works that I did. We see the works that Jesus did and we go, well, yeah, you know, that was Jesus. But actually, he didn't do any mighty works until he was water baptized and came up out of the water. And the Holy Spirit descended upon him in the form of a dove. And then his ministry began. Then he began to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. And, and signs and wonders began to happen through Jesus' ministry. Amen? Amen? Well, God has provided, point number two, God has provided the power we need in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We need power in our lives. Would you agree? Amen. We need strength in our lives. Would you agree? Amen. We need to see some of these things happen in our lives. I'm tired of hearing about people just medicated for this and medicated for that, when sometimes it's maybe a demon that needs to be cast out or maybe it's healing that needs to come. Now, I'm not saying everything's demonic, but I'm just saying that, you know, have you caught on that medical science in many areas has reached the end of themselves? And some of you have gotten those kinds of reports where the doctor says, we've done all we can do. In these last days, we need signs. We need wonders. We need the power of God in manifestation. So people can get delivered from demonic things that cause them to act crazy. The power of God to heal people from things that are, are incurable for the glory of God. We just prayed for a little boy that was found at the bottom of a swimming pool. The people involved with the pool said it was only two minutes, but the m medical doctors said, oh no, it was much longer than that. He was unconscious. He had a lot of fluid in his lungs. And we prayed and we prayed. And three days later, he's walking and playing. A little boy, a little boy. The friend of Lori Gamp. We prayed for that little boy. That's the kind of thing that we need to happen. Amen? Amen. Amen. So he's provided the power that we need in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, you might have been taught like I was. I don't know. I don't know your background. But I was taught that when you're born again and you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that's, that's all there is. And you know, you're, you're, a good Christ, you're a Christian now, so go, you know, go be a good Christian. But actually, when Jesus' disciples, after he rose from the dead, when they came to him, and they were so excited that he was now raised from the dead, he was now come back to life. And if I would have been one of those disciples, I would have wanted to run and tell everybody. I would have especially wanted to run back to those Pharisees and those Roman soldiers and said, nan, 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 nan. <laughs> he is the son of God. He has come back to life. He is going to get you. <laughs> but he's basically said, don't go anywhere. Don't do anything. That's found in Luke 24, 49. Don't go anywhere. Don't do anything until you are endued. And we learned from Al Fury, endued means clothed. Until you are endued with power. Now the last chapter in the book of John, it says that Jesus breathed on them and said receive the Holy Spirit. So they were born again at that point. But then he said, I want you to wait in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power. So many times we get people born again and we say, now go get somebody else born again. But he didn't do that. He said, you need to wait until you receive power. He wasn't sending them out just defenseless. He wasn't sending them out in their own strength, in their own effort. He said,
said you need the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said that. And then I don't have it on the overhead, but you can turn to Acts 1 where Al Fury took us the other night. Where Jesus reiterated the same thing in Acts 1, 8. He says, but you will receive power. That word power, that dunamis. You will receive dynamite power. Explosions of almightiness. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. You will be a witness. Not necessarily that you're going to stand on a street corner and witness unless God leads you to do that. But your life will be a bold witness and declaration of his life. People will see in you what they saw in Jesus. Yeah. I'm so tired about he hearing Christians that leave defeated lives. That are bad witnesses on their jobs and, and in their neighborhoods. When we are the light of the world. And he said that we would be witnesses. That our lives would speak boldly to the world. Peter is such a fine example. Denied Jesus three times. Cursed and said, I never knew him. I never knew him. At the foot of the cross, when he needed his friends, they all fled, says. But then three days later, excuse me, not three days later. Three days later, Jesus rose. And then about 40 days later, when the Holy Spirit comes. 50 days later, excuse me, when the Holy Spirit comes, Peter preaches a sermon, Acts 2. And his first sermon, without Bible college, over 3,000 come to Jesus. Same Peter, what's the difference? The power of the Holy Spirit. He's now filled with the Holy Spirit. He's now filled with the Holy Spirit. It's one thing to be born of the Spirit. It's another thing to be filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. Now turn in your Bibles to Acts 8, verse 5 through 8. And we see here such a perfect example of the difference between being born again and being filled with the Holy Spirit. And when you see it clearly in the Word of God, again, you're, you know you're on solid ground to do what God's called you to do. In Acts 8... Starting with verse 5, it says, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. You know, Philip, that other usher that got picked along with Stephen? Yeah, he's out doing stuff too. Anyway, I'm sorry. I just like to meddle a little bit. He did, they heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed. And many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Then let's look on down to verse 12. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God, and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Now, would you say they're born again here? Yes, absolutely. They believed the things he said, and they were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed when he was baptized. And he, when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. This is talking about Simon the sorcerer. He had been a sorcerer, but now he was born again. Then let's look at verse 14. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they were born again. They heard that the word of God had been preached and they had received. It says that they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They'd received Jesus, they were baptized, but yet the Holy Spirit had not fallen upon them. Then it says, they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. 
And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, and then he got rebuked for doing that. But do you see here that there's two different situations that went on? The people in Samaria received Jesus. They were born again. They got water baptized. And now the apostles come down from Jerusalem, lay hands on them, and they are filled with the Holy Spirit. Can you see we have two different situations going on? And all through the book of Acts, people heard the word. They were born again. They got water baptized. And then they were filled with the Holy Spirit. We see it over and over again all through the book of Acts. But somehow, in our modern day churches, we've been led to think that you get born again and that's all there is. Well, there's not two Holy Spirits. There's only one Holy Spirit. But it's one thing, as I said, to be born of the Spirit. It's another thing to be filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. He, and the, the difference is in the dimension. The word baptism comes from the word baptizo. And it means a total submersion or immersion in the power of God. It's like the lights are on when you're born again. But when you get filled with the Spirit, they come on really bright. When I got filled with the Holy Spirit, the thing that I think ministered to me almost more than anything was being able to get in the Word of God and have the teacher, the Holy Spirit, there in His fullness just to reveal to me what the Word of God meant and said. And the Word became alive to me, and I hungered for it, and you couldn't keep me out of the Word of God. I had a hard time doing my college studies because I had such a hunger for the Word of God because there was life and there was answers in the Word of God, and I had the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, to teach me what it said. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're actually filled with the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And when he comes in, he brings with him the gift of the Spirit. You're filled to overflowing. You're baptized in his presence. And then there's nine gifts or manifestations or ways that he can operate through you as the Spirit wills. And I like to say, and as you yield. Because you've always got to cooperate with him. But in studying and learning about the gifts of the Spirit, I began to understand why perhaps in the New Testament we see when believers are filled with the Holy Spirit over and over again, it says that they spoke in tongues. Or they spoke in tongues and magnified God. Or they spoke in tongues and prophesied. But for some reason, of the nine gifts of the Spirit, that was the first one that we see people operated in. Well, turning your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 12, and we're going to look at the gifts of the Spirit because there's nine ways in which He can manifest Himself through you supernaturally. We're not talking about the fruit of the Spirit here. That's going to grow in your life, the character of God, the, the, knowing how to, to cooperate with the Holy Spirit and show, express the love of God. But the gifts of the Spirit, one minister said, are the weapons of our warfare. And they're what we do onslaught with the kingdom of darkness. We're in a spiritual warfare. Have you caught on? But we're fighting an enemy we can't even see. And yet, there are nine tools, nine weapons that we can have operating in our life that just pull back the cover on the works of the enemy and, and cause us to, to just thwart his kingdom, as I said. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7, it says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith, that special faith, to raise someone from the dead by the same Spirit, to another, gifts of healings by the same Spirit. Wouldn't you like gifts of healings to operate through you? <clears throat> to another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distribut distributing to each one individually as He wills. So these are the nine gifts of the Spirit. These are nine ways in which He can manifest through you. 
Yet for some reason, in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, and you can do your own little homework study. If you take Bible college class, we could spend more time on this. But in every instance, when believers are filled with the Spirit, it says that they operated in this gift, glossolalia, that they spoke in other tongues. Now, in Acts 2, when they spoke in other tongues, these were known languages of the day that people were there for the feast of Pentecost and heard them speak in their own languages, and it was a sign to them. But 1 Corinthians 13, 1 says, Though I speak in the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, it's a sounding brass or a, a clanging cymbal. So we can see that there's, there's known tongues and unknown tongues, but it's still unknown to you as a speaker unless you've studied that language. So it's still the same gift. And there are different uh, degrees of this gift. There's different ways. As we read in 1 Corinthians 12, it says there's different manifestations or different operations. There's different ways in which they manifest. But yet, it's as the Spirit wills and it can operate through us. Amen? So, <clears throat> for some reason, in the book of Acts, when believers were filled... It says that they spoke in tongues. That's the first gift that we see. And you know, I minister to a lot of people. I've ministered the baptism of the Holy Spirit for 35 years. And when I got filled, I don't know, I just immediately, I knew that there were so many Christians that didn't know about the power of God. And my life was so dramatically changed. I went from a backslidden Christian, insecure, doing drugs, sleeping around, yet midnight confessions every night. To now fill with the Holy Spirit, repent, I, of course I repented, but fill with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit did a 180 in my life and I went forward in boldness and in strength, preaching to everything that moved and some things that didn't. And all I knew was there were so many Christians out there and I didn't know if anybody else was telling them, but I was going to tell them that they could be filled with the Holy Spirit, they could have the power of God in their life, they could sense the saturated presence of God and sit at his feet and have him heal their hearts and strengthen them. And I knew that people needed that. And so it became the passion of my heart to get people filled. So I began to operate in that way. God began to use me in that way. But I began to see people would say, well, you know, yeah, I want the power of God. Yeah, power, power, power. I want the power of God. But now this tongues thing, that's kind of weird. And they, they didn't talk like that. I, didn't, I wasn't in Oklahoma at that time. <laughs> but anyway, but there was, you know, there's just, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of weird. It just seems kind of strange. Like, why tongues? What's that all about? So it set me on a quest to study the Word of God. And I went to the Word of God. And I studied 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11 there, all the gifts of the Spirit. I studied the book of Acts every instance when they got filled. And I saw them speak in tongues. And I began to ask God about, God, you know, why tongues? What is that all about? Why is that the first gift that we see in operation? Well, he began to show me the purpose for speaking in tongues. And when I understand the purpose, understood the purpose, then it just made sense to me. Now, I'm not going to emphasize this gift over the other gifts in, in importance. But I am going to put some emphasis here for a few moments just because I believe God has, but I believe when we see the, the purpose of it, you'll understand why this is perhaps the first gift that we see in operation. Turning your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 14. And you know, every word of God is true. Every word that's been recorded for us is true. There's no word that's here, as our pastor says, that's just for an, uh, uh, an unknown reason or without validity. So turn to 1 Corinthians 14, and we're going to see that Paul was writing here to the, the Corinthian church, much like many churches today. And he wasn't saying, don't speak in tongues. He wasn't saying that. But he was trying to get them to understand the importance of the gifts that should be operating in the corporate church worship service versus what should go on in your own personal private life. And he was trying to bring balance into the church. But I think many churches have actually thrown the baby out with the bathwater and they haven't seen the other side of what he was trying to say. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 14. Let's look at verse 2. 
It says, he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men. Not even to you. You're not even speaking to yourself. But to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. And that word mysteries means divine secrets. Mysterion. Divine secrets. God talk. You don't know what you're saying. But the Holy Spirit is praying through you, and God understands every word. And it's like a free flow of faith that not even your mind is in the way, but you're cooperating with the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 26 says that he helps us in our weaknesses when we don't know what to pray for as we ought. When I began to pray in the Spirit for my family as a young, a young adult, I was 21, when I got filled with the Holy Spirit, as I began to pray for my family, immediately different ones began to receive Jesus because I was praying effectively, led by the Holy Spirit. I didn't know what my sister Jenny needed. I didn't know what my sister Polly needed. I didn't know what it would take for them to come back to the Lord and to know Him deeper. But the Holy Spirit did. And so I cooperated with the Holy Spirit and allowed Him to pray through me according to the will of God. But it says here that when you pray in the Spirit, it says, he who speaks in tongues does not speak to men. So you're not even talking to you, so don't worry if you don't know what you're saying. But to God, for no one understands him, not even you. But in the Spirit, you're speaking mysteries. Let's look at verse 4. It says, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. He who speaks in a tongue, an unknown tongue, here he's talking about speaking in tongues, edifies himself. That word edify is where we get our word edifice. And it literally means to build yourself up like a strong tower on the inside. I was weak. I was insecure. I didn't know the direction for my life. I didn't know how to live boldly for God. I didn't know how to overcome sin. I didn't know how to say no to the devil in temptation. But when I got filled with the Holy Spirit and began to pray in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit supercharged me on the inside, built me up like a strong edifice on the inside. And when you're edified, you can be used of God. That's why in looking at the gifts of the Spirit, every one of the gifts actually is for you to minister to someone else. Gifts of healings is for you to lay hands on the sick and for them to recover. Having a word of knowledge is a word of God's knowledge for you to minister to someone. A word in due season that they need that will answer the question on their heart. All the gifts are for you to reach out to a lost and dying world and to be empowered by the Spirit of God to affect the kingdom of darkness. Except speaking in tongues. Paul says here it's really not about other people. But it's about you speaking to God. You don't even understand. But you're speaking mysteries to God, divine secrets. You're cooperating with the Holy Spirit. God's hearing. God's working. And as a result, you're edified. You're built up. And so personally, it answered some questions for me. That perhaps this was the reason that we saw that as the first gift in manifestation. Because I found, you know, with God... He will be number one. Have you caught on? He wants to be number one with your day. He wants to be number one with your finances. He wants to be number one with your heart. If he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. And he will not use you to minister to others and just spend you and just use you and then not care what's going on in your life. And it just made sense to me that perhaps this is the reason that it's the first gift that we see because he wants us to come to him, to pray in a, another language that we don't understand, to speak mysteries to him, to cooperate with the Holy Spirit so he can pray through us and we can be edified. That's why I like to call it the door opener to the gifts because once you're edified, once you're built up, then you can go out and you're more sensitive to the Holy Spirit to be used of him to minister to others. Are you with me? Are you with me? Are you getting something tonight? Amen. Amen, amen. 
While you're in 1 Corinthians 14, I got a lot of verses. Turn to verse 14. Don't worry, I'm not going to go to all of them. You're getting nervous. <laughs> in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 14, Paul says, For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. That's why sometimes around here we'll call it praying in the spirit. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. Again, you're not going to know what you're saying, you little control freak. <laughs> and that's where we have trouble. Pastor Sue, how am I going to know what I'm saying? You're not. You're not. Is that okay? He says, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. And then he says, what is the conclusion then? I will pray with the spirit. I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the spirit. I will also sing with the understanding. Look down at verse 18. Paul said, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. So the great apostle Paul, who wrote over two-thirds of the New Testament, felt a need to pray in tongues and said, I pray in tongues more than you all. There's praying in tongues. It's not meant to be uh, interpreted and would be uh, tantamount to prophecy in a, in a corporate worship service. Actually, in this chapter, he was doing a lot what we emphasize around here, that the primary purpose for speaking in tongues is really not about everybody else. It really is not really about the corporate worship service per se, except right now we're, we're having teaching in this area. But it's more about you and your private devotion, praying to God, being used, cooperating with the Holy Spirit to intercede and, and to pray for people and situations and, and to come into the presence of God. And then as a result, to be built up yourself and to be bold and strong in your walk so that you can go forth and, and be the Christian that he's called you to be. It's by his power. We can't do it in our own strength. Amen? Are you with me? Number three, we must cooperate in order to experience the gift of the Spirit in our lives. We have to cooperate. And that's something that a lot of people don't realize. On the day of P Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came in like a rushing mighty wind. And he filled the house. There was 120 of them. It wasn't just the 12 apostles. Yes, even... Mother Mary was there. And the Holy Spirit, like, a, like a, a tongue of fire, stood on each of them, over each of them. And they began to speak in tongues and magnify God. And before they knew it, they're out in the courtyard preaching and, and speaking in tongues and magnifying God. That was when the Holy Spirit was initially poured out. When they were trying to show the Gentiles that they needed to receive, the Holy Spirit was poured out. But generally, the Holy Spirit is ministered by believers laying hands on other believers. And it, did, it wasn't just about the apostles. That was an argument that I learned in my church. Ananias, who was a disciple, laid hands on Saul, who went to go, to go on to be the great apostle Paul, for him to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to re receive his sight. So we see that people were filled with the Holy Spirit because they open their heart. And there has to be a cooperation on your part to experience this. God will not do anything against your will. He won't make you come down these aisles to receive Jesus tonight if you need to. He won't make you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'd like to make you, but he won't. <laughs> I have to be honest. But we have to cooperate with him. And that's where sometimes people don't re re understand. Hands are laid on you, or you open your heart to receive. And yes, the Holy Spirit can just fall on you. Fell on my sister in the shower. She came floating out, laid on her bed, and spoke in tongues for about an hour. <laughs> but generally, we see that believers laid hands on people for them to receive because there's, a, there's an impartation. There's a, me adding my faith to yours for you to receive. But then there has to be a cooperation on your part because the Holy Spirit's a gentleman. He's not going to make you do this. You know, he alighted upon Jesus in the form of a dove. That's a very gentle bird. 
Oh, the Holy Spirit's powerful. Don't get me wrong. But he will always honor your will. And when you just set yourself, mm, not going to do it. There's no way. Not, no, not me. No. I have decided. You know, then nothing will happen. Because God will so honor your free will. Do you know he'll allow you to go to hell if you want? Because you have that right to decide. He won't make you even go to heaven. That, that blows me away. But because he so honors us. In Ephesians 5, 18 through 19, it says, Do not be drunk with wine wherein is in which is dissipation or excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, sing singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. He says, Do not be drunk with with wine, another translation says, we're in his excess. Don't be drunk with wine. That's a good word for some of you. <laughs> but be filled with the Spirit. He's making a parallel here. Hmm. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And I like the way he says, be filled with the Spirit. He doesn't say you should be, good idea, maybe think about it. Be filled with the Spirit. You know, I... When I got filled with the Spirit, I understood what drugs and drinking was really all about. That's why I got high all the time. When you have a lot of pain, you want to escape the pain. I'm not saying it's right, but that's what happens. Oh, just say no. Why do I want to say no? It's a miserable existence. I want to, you know, I don't mind a slow death. I just want to get out of this. I just want to stuff the pain. But he says, don't be drunk with wine. Don't get high on anything that any counterfeit that the enemy would have. But be filled with the Spirit. And I'll tell you, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, when you experience His overwhelming presence and glory and wonder and, and strengthening power, anything else is like coming down. I ran back to my little hippie pad and I said to all my little hippie friends, you guys, that is like coming down. That is like coming down. What the enemy does is he gets people sidetracked and addicted to these things that just keep them in spin cycle, only to, to just deteriorate their lives. But God intended that we know the fullness of his presence, the fullness of his power, so that we would not have the pain. The pain would be gone. The pain would be healed. And then we'd have no need for those things. It's like he tries to get us to settle for fool's gold. Oh, don't give me that costume jewelry. Yeah, it's okay. I get it on sale at Kohl's. But when we were getting married, I wanted the real thing. Honey, you get, you get, me, you get me the real diamond. In fact, we're talking about it. I, don't, I think, you know, we got a few anniversaries coming up now. I think we're ready for a bigger one. But when you experience the real thing, you don't want the counterfeit. They don't counterfeit $3 bills. Yes, there's some excess. Yes, there's some abuse. Yes, there's some weird cults that do weird things. But when you see in the Word of God that it's a valid truth for us today, then we're faced with the Word of God and we have to make a decision. And there's so many of you that if you would know the fullness of the presence and the power of God, you'd never go back to those things that have tempted you before. Because you would have no need. The pain's gone. You don't have to stuff the pain when it's gone. It didn't cost you anything. You didn't end up with, in bed with the wrong person. You aren't sorry the morning after, the night before. And we can walk in his presence. We can walk filled with the Spirit. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Making melody in your heart to the Lord. God wants you filled with the Holy Spirit tonight. Amen. Now let's look at one more portion of scripture and then we're going to minister. Turn it to the book of Acts, in the book of Acts to chapter 2. <clears throat> are you doing okay with me tonight? Yes. Everybody good? Yes. All right. Are you learning anything? Yes. Okay, some of you diehards, I'm looking at you. Thinking, you get up here, you can teach this. No, anyway, Acts 2. I'm sorry, I got this left side I got to watch out for. In Acts 2, let's look at what happened on the day of Pentecost. 
It says in verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. I think that was the first miracle right there. But verse 2, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled, everyone say filled, filled, filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. First they were filled with the Spirit, and then they began to speak. As they began to speak, the Holy Spirit gave them the utterance. When you get filled tonight, you're going to have to begin to speak. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He's not going to make your mouth open. He's not going to make your tongue move. Your little step of faith will begin to speak prompted by the Holy Spirit, believing that you're filled with the Spirit, believing that when you speak, heavenly tongues are going to flow from your mouth. Some little syllables might come to your mind or rise up in your heart. And you begin to speak that out by faith, trusting the Holy Spirit. And most of the time, it'll surprise you how supernaturally natural it is. But when you begin to pray in the Spirit, you'll begin to see prayers answered like you never had them answered before. You'll begin to see an edification, a strength in your life. There's been times... You know, that I just take it by faith. I've gotten, spent time praying in the Spirit, and when I was done, didn't feel a whole lot different. And I said, God, you said that when I prayed in the Spirit, I would be edified, so I believe I'm edified. And then I've gone out later in the day, and almost like a little billiard ball, I've gone from situation to situation, just like a Holy Spirit set up all day long, being in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing, with a supernatural grace and power upon me. This is not just feeling oriented. Oh, I, you know, I believe I've received if I get goosebumps. You'll have some feeling, and it's wonderful. And yes, you can even literally be high in the Spirit. I've been almost like drunk laid out on my bed before with the power of the Holy Spirit just flowing over me and flowing over me because He wants to heal and help us. But then you get up from that place whether you feel anything or not, and you say, thank you, Father. I believe I'm edified. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for praying through me. Thank you for doing something amazing in me and through me. He'll bring you into his presence in such a rich way. There'll be times that you just, just almost can't make yourself do something else because you're just having such a rich time in his presence. Him ministering to you and showing you what the word of God says. I can't say enough about the need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Do you believe that tonight? How many believe that tonight? How many believe that tonight? Do the believers believe? Do the believers believe? I want to know if the believers believe. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now here's the deal. In a few minutes we're, gonna, we're going to minister to you. There's a heart, there are hearts hungry and ready and I can sense that. So I'm tempted to just go there quickly. But before we do that, I need to ask you a question. I want you to sit up real straight. I want you to think about this. And I want you to answer this question in your own heart. It's not anybody else's business. This is a God moment right now with you and the Holy Spirit. I would be wrong to assume that you're all Christians tonight. Because I can't see your heart and I don't know your walk. I would be wrong to assume that. So I'm not going to. But right now, I'm going to ask you a question. And you on the inside, you answer it for yourself. And you identify where you are with God. If you were to die tonight through no will of your own, obviously, God forbid. But if it were to happen, if this was your last moment on earth, and your spirit would leave your body, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? This is a question that only you can answer. Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? You might say, well, gosh, I'd hope I'd go to heaven. I, uh, you know, that, that would be good. I, I think I would go to heaven. See, we're not talking about a religious form here. 
We're not talking about do this, do that, and, you know, two plus two equals four. We're talking about a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We're talking about knowing him personally. And if you know God and you've made Jesus the Lord of your life, you know if you're born again or not. There's no doubt because that relationship is intact and you walk with him and you know him and he knows you. So if there's a hope or a maybe there or a think so, you need to think and examine your heart. You need to be assured of your salvation. You need to know that should, should you go to meet your maker tonight that you would forever be with him. You might say, well, I've been a good person. You know, I, I haven't robbed any banks. I only cheat a little bit on my income tax. You know, I'm a good person. But the Bible says that your goodness, your own goodness, is as a filthy rag to God. See, we can't get good enough for God. We have an incurable blood disease called sin. A dog barks because he's a dog. A sinner sins because he's a sinner. And we're all born into this world through no choice of our own. We're all born into this world under a curse of sin. And the fact of the matter is you need a new nature. And so just being good enough, just trying to earn brownie points with God, it's, that's not even the case. That's, that doesn't even make sense. Because you cannot get good enough for a holy God. You need his righteousness given to you as a free gift. You need his goodness. You need a new nature. You might say, well, you know, I, um, you know, I said a prayer once at a, at a crusade. You know, I prayed a prayer. But it's not just praying a prayer at one point, just, you know, repeating after someone like a little parrot and then not walk, continuing to walk with him. God's not, he's not stupid. He knows your heart. As I said a little while ago, if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. Maybe you, you've walked with God for a while, but you know, you're just, you're just kind of straddling the fence. You know, you come to church every now and then, somebody drug you here tonight. But you're not really living for God. You haven't allowed him to invade every room of your house. You haven't allowed him to be really Lord over every area of your life. And the Bible says in the book of Revelation that he would have us hot or cold. See, if we're cold, he can convict us. He can send laborers to us. He can do something. He said, I would that you would be hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I will spew you or vomit you out of my mouth. See, a lukewarm person kind of passes by themselves that they did the right thing, they said the right prayer, they, they got some brownie points somewhere, and so therefore they're, they're going to be a part of this, this club called Christian. But that's not what being a Christian is all about. It's serving God with all of your heart, all of your life. I'm not saying be perfect. He's the only one that's perfect, and he gives us his perfection. But I'm saying that the intent of your heart is to live for him and you love him. He is the Lord of your life. You've given him all of your heart, all of your life. There was a man named Nicodemus that came to Jesus and he wanted to know, you know, what do I do to enter the kingdom? You know, I, he was a leader in the synagogue. He was the righteous man of his day. He would be like a minister of a large church right now. But Jesus said to him, Nicodemus, you must be born again. He says, do I crawl back in my mother's womb? How can this be? And Jesus, no. He said, no. What is born of the flesh is flesh. But what is born of the spirit is spirit. You must be born again. You need a new nature. Now, if you're hoping you're saved tonight, you're not sure, I'm talking to you. You've prayed a prayer, but you haven't been living for God. It was just like a parrot thing that you did that somebody said if you did it, you'd get saved but you haven't really committed your life to him. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's all about giving God all of your heart, all of your life, making a once and for all commitment to him. If that's you, I'm speaking to you. Right now I'm going to count to three. 
When I clap my hands together like this, I want you to raise your hand. You might say, oh, I'll be embarrassed. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. You might be, but I'll tell you, if you were in hell, you'd be lifting anything you could grab to get out of there. So don't let a moment of embarrassment hinder you from doing what you know you need to do to make Jesus the Lord of your life and to receive a new nature. So I'm going to count to three. Are you ready? One, two, three. Hands raised all over this place. If you need to make Jesus your Lord, I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Anyone else? I see that hand. Anyone else? I see that hand. Anyone else? Did I get everybody? I see that hand. I'm sorry, I'm not counting. I see that hand. Hands all over. Right now, because of the nature of the ministry that we're going to have tonight, I want everyone to bow your head. We're going to pray a corporate prayer. But those of you that have raised your hands, at the end of the service, I want you to come up. You're going to see Pastor Dave over here to my right. And he's going to have some literature for you. This is very important because we want you to get on the right track to lead an overcoming life in Christ. We want to give you some material that shows you um, what the Word of God says about this new life for you. So right now we're going to pray. Everyone's going to repeat this prayer after me and be praying along with you. If there's anyone that needs to pray this for the first time that did not raise your hand, please, from your heart, make this commitment to God. And then afterwards, I want you to come up and see Pastor Dave in just a, a, at the end of the service. But let's pray. Dear Father, I come to you now as a sinner. Jesus, I repent of my sin. I turn from it. And I look to you. Jesus, be the Lord of my life. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. You are my Father. You are my Lord. I make you Lord over every area of my life. I am now a Christian. I am now born again of your spirit. I receive this free gift of eternal life from your hand, Lord Jesus. I love you. I will serve you with my whole life in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Let's just give a big clap offering for all of those. to do at this time, we still have, oh, we're a couple minutes over. Are you okay? Are you good with me? Okay. Apologize. Get that cough. What we're going to do at this time is if you know you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit in your life, and I hope I've clearly shown you in the Word of God that it is needed for believers today. We're in a spiritual warfare, and in these last days, which I believe we're in, more than ever, we need the power of God real and strong in our lives so we can be used of God to not just go to heaven ourselves, but to grab some others out of the kingdom of darkness and set them free. It's not, it's not all about us. It's not all about moi. Have you caught on? He wants to use us. It's vital that we know his power and his strength and have the full baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So this time, if you know you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, I want you to just quickly get out of your seats and just come up here. We're going to have some pastors, some of our SPTs. They're going to be laying hands on you. You're going to receive it. We'll go quickly. Don't worry. We don't do anything weird. I'm not going to, you know, turn loose, let go, throw you down, anything like that. Because the Holy Spirit, I, I, I didn't go over every scripture, but the Bible says that Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. I presented the word of God to you, so faith comes by hearing the word. And so I know that's why there's faith in your heart. But it's not about our magical hands. It's about us being in faith and agreeing with you, and then the power of God is there to help you receive. Do you understand? But as I, the last point I made, you have to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. He's not going to just, you know, make you do it. You're going to have to, by faith, receive and then cooperate with him and begin to speak, believing that that first gift of the Spirit, speaking in tongues, is just going to flow through you. And then that's just the door opener. There's the other gift. Prayed with a woman one day. The 
that didn't know where her child was, a, a young teenager, didn't know where he was. We prayed. God showed her he was okay, just staying at a friend. That's different than thinking he's kidnapped. Are you with me? She had a word of knowledge, a word of God's knowledge that held her steady. And sure enough, they found him the next day. But these are the gifts that comfort us in this time that we need. Are you with me? So I'm going to pray. And if I could have, actually, if I could have um, Pastor Dan, some of the other pastors that are here, my husband, um, some of the SPTs that Pastor Dave has talked to, if you could actually come up here with me at facing the, the, the people, and then we'll be laying hands. But I'll tell you, some of you are going to receive before we ever get to me. When Pastor Deborah and I were able to minister in Tanzania, there was like 2,500 women, and there was no way we could minister to all of them. And the Holy Spirit just fell before we could even get to people. They were just speaking in tongues and praising God. And so it's not, you know, don't, don't worry if we haven't got to you yet. You just lift your hands, and you just believe you receive. And just cooperate with the Holy Spirit, and you're going to have that, that, that gift of tongues just flowing through you. Are you ready? Okay, let's lift our hands to the Lord. Say, Dear Father, Dear Father I, receive I receive the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. In, the in the name of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. You, are the you are the baptizer. Baptize me now. Me now. Fill, me Fill me to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. And I thank you that I'll speak in tongues, that I'll have all the gifts of the Spirit in my life, according to your will. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Fill me now. Fill me now. Fill me now. In the name of Jesus. Okay, just be filled.